Now let's look at radiation and begin to understand that. Radiation is simply energy in some form. It can be kinetic energy associated with particles emitted from the nucleus, or it can be electromagnetic radiation, photons, which include both X-rays and gamma rays. What are the usual kinds of particulate radiation? Well, there's alpha particles, beta particles, positrons, protons, neutrons, and there are others. Radiation can be broken into two very broad classes, ionizing and non-ionizing. While non-ionizing radiation can certainly be dangerous, consider microwaves, for example, for this course we will focus exclusively on ionizing radiation. So, the first rhetorical question, what do we mean by ionizing radiation? That goes all the way back to, what do we mean by an ion? If you remember from your physics and chemistry, neutral atoms contain two fundamental parts, the nucleus, which is very small, very heavy, and contains one or more positive charges, and the surrounding cloud of electrons that contain the same number of negative charges. When one of these electrons is removed from the neutral atom, the remaining atom that's missing electrons is called an ion. Ionizing radiation is thus defined as those radiations that have sufficient energy to remove electrons from atoms and produce ions. What's so special about ions? This is a far deeper question than you might realize. Although ions are very common, those from radiation are particularly important to us. From a health physics standpoint, ionizing radiation can scramble the DNA within your cells and could lead to detrimental health effects. From the detector standpoint, it is these ionizations that allow us to detect radioactive material, perhaps identify what kind of material it is, and with more work to quantify the amount of each isotope present. On a historical note, the scientists who discovered radiation in the early days were not particularly inventive. Alpha, beta, and gamma are the first three letters of the Greek alphabet, and x-rays were so named because Röntgen didn't know what they were, so he named them X for the unknown. An alpha particle is a helium nucleus ejected directly from the parent or decaying nucleus. A typical alpha decay is the following. U-235 decays to thorium-231 plus an alpha particle with a half-life of 7.038 times 10 to the 8th years. Let's talk for a minute about what everything means in these equations and what the rules are. The 92 sitting next to the symbol for uranium is the charge of the nucleus. In this case, it's the atomic number, 92 protons. The 235 is the mass number, that is, the total number of nucleons in the uranium nucleus. In this case, 92 protons and 143 neutrons. Likewise, for thorium, that it has an atomic number of 90, and helium with an atomic number of 2. If you think about it, the sum of the mass numbers on the right-hand side of the equation must equal to the mass number on the left-hand side of the equation. Also, one of the deep conservation laws of the universe is that charge is always conserved. So, for this equation, 92 is equal to 90 plus 2. The half-life for alpha decay for uranium-235 is about 704 million years. We've seen beta minus decay already, but now let's name the parts. Tritium, with a half-life of 12.33 years, decays to helium-3 plus an electron plus an antineutrino. Whoa! An electron doesn't weigh anything? Yep, it's true. On the scale of nucleons, zero is good enough for electrons in these balance equations. When we go to calculate mass-energy relationships, then we have to worry about the mass of an electron, but that's for another day. Looking at the electron we, again, we see that it has a minus one charge, and given that, our rule about conserving charge and mass number is kept. 
Neutrinos, the new bar thing on the right-hand side of the equation, is for another day also. But it has no charge and essentially no mass, even compared to an electron. So we can gleefully ignore it for now. Suppose the nucleus has too many protons. How does it change the proton to a neutron? By positron or beta plus decay, like so. Fluorin-19 with a 110-minute half-life goes to oxygen-18 plus a positron plus a neutrino. Whoa, again, you mean they are positively charged electrons? Yep. Uh, They're called positrons and are anti-electrons. When they hit a negatively charged or real electron, both electrons vanish and two photons with energy equal to the mass of the electron appear headed in opposite directions. And yes, this is an example of how mass can be converted directly into energy. Life in the nuclear world is stranger than you think. Given all this, we see that again, all the rules are followed. The new thing on the right-hand side of the equation is a neutrino, not an anti-neutrino, as was the case in beta-minus decay. There's another conservation law known only to nuclear types, known as the conservation of leptons. Electrons, positrons, neutrinos, among other particles, fall into this lepton class. With beta-minus decay, since there's a real electron, there must be an anti-neutrino to balance the lepton books. With positron decay, because there is an anti-electron, there is a real neutrino, again, to bring balance to the universe. Finally, there are other decay paths. Low-Z nuclei can also kick out protons or neutrons from the nucleus directly. These reactions are rare but useful. There are other decay paths besides this, but let's stop here.